Welcome aboard the story of the P6116 Greif. Launched in 1976, a prime example of the German Albatross class fast attack craft. These sleek and formidable vessels were far more than just coastal defenders, they were cutting edge strike platforms of their era. Armed with four Exocet missiles and two powerful 76mm guns, the Albatross boats packed a serious punch for their size. What set them apart was their advanced communication and control systems. They could exchange real-time data with other warships, fleet command, and even a wax early warning aircraft, giving them eyes and ears across the battlefield. Their fire control system allowed them to engage up to four targets at once, while radar and infrared decoys, along with sophisticated electronic warfare equipment, ensured they remained highly survivable and fully interoperable with Allied forces. The P6116 Greif stands as a testament to naval engineering, designed for speed and precision in maritime warfare. Designed in the early 1970s and launched in 1976, the Greif embodied a new generation of missile boats that marked a turning point in German fast attack design. Construction followed a proven transverse frame method. The internal frames, bulkheads and deck beams were made from light metal for structural strength and weight savings, while the builders deliberately preserved a long-standing craftsmanship tradition, the entire outer skin was triple laminated wood, bolted to the frames. That hybrid approach combined the shock-absorbing and reparable advantages of wooden planking with a metallic internal skeleton. Seven of the ten boats of this class were produced at the Lursen shipyard in Bremen Vegesack, the Navy's historic builder of fast attack craft. At 57 meters in length and 378 tons displacement, the class 143 boats were the largest fast attack vessels the German Navy had yet commissioned. Each was manned by a complement of roughly 40 sailors and was notable as the first ship of its size to carry an automatic combat and information system. Propulsion and speed were central to the design. A bespoke 16-cylinder diesel was adapted for continuous high-speed service after rigorous endurance trials. Four such engines, each rated at about 4,000 horsepower, drove a four-shaft propulsion arrangement that pushed the ships to a service speed of approximately 38 knots. Yet the designers argued that fast no longer meant only top speed, it described how swiftly the boat could bring its weapons to bear. Armament reflected that doctrine. The class 143 carried two tubes for wire-guided torpedoes, four launchers for the NM-38 ship-to-ship -ship missile, and two rapid-fire 76mm guns. Survivability was enhanced by protective systems for the crew, ventilation and spray systems for NBC protection, as well as radar and infrared decoys and advanced electronic warfare equipment. In short, the boats combined lethal strike capability with modern defensive and information systems, at a cost comparable to that of a commercial jumbo jet. That expense was deliberate. The new fast attack craft were intended to replace older Jaguar and Sea Eagle patrol boats, together with additional class 148 models arriving from abroad. Their mission was not merely coastal patrol but high-temper missile warfare, rapid detection, rapid targeting, and rapid salvo delivery, all integrated into an automated combat picture. All of these design choices had a direct strategic rationale. In the Baltic Sea during the Cold War the overall numerical ratio between NATO and Warsaw Pact naval forces remained heavily unfavorable, often cited as roughly 1 to 5. When counting conventional fast attack squadrons the gap narrowed, but still favored the East at about 1 to 4. Most striking was the ratio of missile armed fast attack boats, which stood at an alarming 1 to 10. In that environment, Germany could never hope to match quantity with quantity. 
Instead, the Bond's marine pursued quality, fewer vessels but vastly superior in sensors, weapons integration, crew protection, and the speed of weapon deployment. Put bluntly, when you were outnumbered 10 to 1 in missile boats, each German craft had to outmatch an opponent by more than just firepower. It had to be quicker to detect threats, faster to decide and act, better networked with fleet command and AWACS, and more survivable in the face of countermeasures. The class 143 boats, including the Greif, were designed to do exactly that, to turn technological edge into operational leverage and so help balance the scales in a numerically unequal theater. One of the most distinctive features of the Albatross class armament was the pair of rapid firing 76mm naval guns. These were compact, fully automatic weapons designed to deliver a very high rate of fire, up to 85 rounds per minute. Mounted fore and aft, they gave the P6116 Gryph all around coverage against a wide range of threats. These guns were not limited to a single role. At sea, they could be turned against enemy fast attack craft, striking with explosive shells at ranges of more than 15 kilometers. In the air, they could track and engage low-flying aircraft or even incoming missiles, forming part of the ships close in defense. And against coastal targets, they could deliver sustained bombardment, supporting amphibious operations or shoreline engagements. The weapon itself was highly automated. Ammunition was fed from below deck through a ready magazine, allowing the crew to maintain continuous fire with minimal exposure. Operators could switch between different types of ammunition, high explosive, anti-air, or illuminating rounds, depending on the mission at hand. Two such guns meant the Greif could open fire simultaneously in multiple directions, creating overlapping fields of defensive and offensive fire. When we talk about the Greif's real punch, we have to talk about the Exocet, the compact, sea-skimming anti-ship missile that turned small boats into ocean predators. The Albatross class carried four Exocet launchers, and that quartet defined the ship's long-range striking ability. First, a quick note on terminology, sources sometimes list different designations, the ship-launched Exocet family is commonly referred to as the MM38, MM40 series. Depending on the exact fit and upgrade, the boats carried the ship-launched Exocet variant appropriate to their era. Range, speed and guidance specifics vary by model, so I'll give the general picture you can trust. Physically, the launchers were simple, rugged box canisters mounted on deck. Each canister protected the missile until launch, then swung or elevated to a firing angle and expelled the missile with a short pre-launch boost. In flight, an Exocet was lethal and cunning. After launch it climbed briefly, then descended into a low, sea-skimming flight profile that kept it under radar horizons and made detection difficult until the last moments. Guidance combined inertial navigation for mid-course flight with an active radar seeker in the terminal phase, meaning the missile could autonomously home onto a selected ship once it locked on. Impact was delivered by a high-explosive warhead optimized to punch through hull plating and detonate below the waterline, inflicting catastrophic flooding. Exis A cruised at roughly high subsonic speeds and carried a warhead typically in the order of 1 to 200 kilograms. Operationally, four launchers created tactical options. The crew could fire single missiles for precision strikes, or launch coordinated salvos to overwhelm a target's point defenses and saturate its sensors. On a fast, networked platform like the Greif, Exisay were fed target data from the ship's sensors and, when available, from off-board sources such as other warships or airborne early warning aircraft. That networked targeting gave the boat's reach and flexibility far beyond what their hull size suggested. But Exis A were not invulnerable. 
Their sea skimming profile and active seeker made them susceptible to modern electronic countermeasures, decoys and close-in weapon systems if detected early. That is why the Albatross boats combined missile offense with radar decoys, infrared countermeasures, and an advanced fire control and electronic warfare suite, to both improve attack success and reduce the chance of a missile strike against themselves. In addition to guns and missiles, the Greif carried two tubes for wire-guided torpedoes, allowing her to threaten not only surface vessels but submarines as well. So how did they work? A wire-guided torpedo is launched from its tube and unspools a thin, strong wire back to the firing ship. Through that wire the launching vessel can send steering commands to the torpedo during its run. It's comparable to modern drones controlled via fiber optic cables. That means the crew, or the ship's fire control system, could correct the torpedo's course after launch, guide it around countermeasures, or update its target if the tactical picture changed. In practical terms, wire guidance made the torpedo far more flexible and reliable in cluttered littoral waters than a purely autonomous weapon. Tactically, the torpedo offered two distinct roles. First, as an anti-submarine weapon, it allowed a fast attack boat to threaten enemy submarines detected at shallow depths or in constrained waters where depth charge attacks were impractical. Second, as a close-range anti-surface weapon, a torpedo could be used against larger ships that had survived a missile salvo or were operating in coastal areas where missile employment might be restricted. The boats were designed to use long-range Exocet missiles as their primary striking tool. Torpedoes were a secondary, situational weapon, useful, but only in scenarios where proximity and stealth were possible. Instead of combat, torpedoes were employed in exercises, training launches and at sea trials, that maintain crew proficiency without the need for combat employment. In short, the twin-wire guided torpedo tubes on the Albatross boats were a potent and flexible tool on paper, giving a small ship an underwater punch as well as a surface option, but history and strategy conspired so that they remained a capability never tested in live combat by the German crews. When you look at a vessel like the Greif, what you don't always see at first glance is how much of her survival depended on invisible systems, sensors, countermeasures and crew protection that work together to keep the ship alive. First, sensors. The Albatross boats carried compact but capable radar suites and electronic support measures. Those radars searched the horizon, tracked contacts and fed continuous targeting data into the ship's combat information system. At the same time, ESM gear listened to the electromagnetic spectrum, picking up radar emissions from other ships and aircraft, warning the crew of tracking or targeting attempts before a weapon was even launched. In short, the ship's eyes and ears were always working to give the crew time, and time is survival. Next came the countermeasures. If a hostile radar or missile locked in, the Greif didn't just sit there. She could launch chaff, strips of metallic foil that created a cloud of radar echoes and confused incoming seekers, or deploy infrared decoys and flares to seduce heat-seeking threats away from the ship. These decoys were compact, fast to use and surprisingly effective at breaking a missile's lock in a chaotic, cluttered littoral environment. But the real defensive edge came from electronic warfare. The boat carried DU transmitters and jammers able to blind or spoof incoming sensors, degrade enemy targeting data and protect the missile boat's own fire control picture. On a modern engagement that meant the difference between being seen as a target and being treated as an electronic ghost, noisy, deceptive emissions could mask the ship's true position and timing, letting her fire first and then slip away. All of this, radar, ESM, chaff, flares and jamming, worked as a layered defense. Radar would give the warning, ESM would refine it, jammers and decoys would disrupt the attack, and the crew would use maneuver and speed to break contact. 
Finally, there was crew protection, NBC systems that were quietly critical. The Albatross boats were fitted with ventilation and spray systems, specialized filters and the ability to see living compartments to guard against nuclear, biological and chemical contamination. Those systems let the ship continue to operate in degraded environments, air intakes could be closed, overpressure established, and the crew sheltered while mission critical systems remained online. When the Albatross class first entered service in the mid-1970s, it represented one of the most advanced weapon systems of the German Navy. Seven of them, including the P-6116 Greif, joined the fleet between 1976 and 1977. They were grouped into two squadrons and stationed along the northern coast, ready to respond at a moment's notice. During the Cold War, their role was clear to patrol, to deter, and to show that NATO had teeth in the Baltic Sea. By the 1980s, the Albatross design was already being upgraded into what became known as the Class 143A, or the Gepard class. These new boats carried improved sensors, an advanced combat information system, and even anti-air missile launchers to give them a far stronger defensive punch. The original Albatross boats, however, didn't disappear right away. They served faithfully into the early 2000s before being retired from the German Navy. And what happened to them next is just as interesting. Instead of being scrapped, many were passed on to Allied navies. Six boats were transferred to Tunisia, where they still operate today, though with their missile systems removed. Two others made their way to Ghana in 2010, boosting that country's coastal defense fleet. And even now, decades later, the legacy of these fast attack craft lives on, sailing under different flags, still guarding coastlines and still carrying forward the engineering lessons learned in the tense years of East vs West. Thanks for watching.